Hello everyone, my name is Gail and today I'll be talking to you about pediatric vascular anomalies. Vascular anomaly is a term used to describe any abnormality of vessels. It is important to recognize that the term vascular anomaly encompasses a wide spectrum of abnormalities and establishing an accurate diagnosis is critical for determining appropriate treatment. Some vascular anomalies are subtle skin discolorations, whereas other vascular anomalies are significantly disfiguring and may have significant functional consequences. Some anomalies will require no treatment, while others will require a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach. Although vascular disease and treatments are common in adults, in general, the topic of vascular anomalies is unique to pediatrics, as many vascular anomalies are congenital and many present in childhood. On the next few slides, we are going to spend some time talking about the classification and appropriate terminology for vascular anomalies. This is important because there is a history of confusing and unclear terminology which can lead to incorrect diagnoses. It is common to see all vascular anomalies indiscriminately referred to as hemangiomas or arteriovenous malformations. Incorrect diagnosis can easily lead to incorrect treatments or lead to suboptimal functional and aesthetic outcomes. The ISSVA classification of vascular anomalies arises from the work of Mullikan and Glavatsky in 1982. This classification system divides vascular anomalies into two primary groups based on their histopathology. The first and most common group is vascular tumors. These are true neoplasms that are defined by the presence of endothelial cell proliferation or mitoses on histology. Because these tumors are defined by abnormal cellular proliferation, the growth of the lesion will not be proportional to the growth of the child. We can further define these lesions as benign, locally invasive, or malignant. Throughout this talk, we are going to focus on benign vascular tumors, or specifically hemangiomas, as these are by far the most common vascular tumor in children. The second category of vascular anomalies is vascular malformations. Unlike vascular tumors, these are abnormal vascular channels that do not have any abnormal cellular proliferation or no mitoses on histology. Because these lesions do not have abnormal cellular proliferation, the growth of these lesions will be in proportion to the growth of the child. Vascular malformations are then further defined by the flow of the malformation. Capillary, venous, and lymphatic malformations are slow flow lesions, whereas arteriovenous malformations are fast flow. Of course, vascular malformations may be mixed type. However, in these cases, often one type predominates, and for the purpose of this talk, we will treat these categories as separate. There is an additional classification system that is commonly used. The Hamburg classification system arose in 1992 and further classifies vascular malformations based on their embryologic development. In this classification system, vascular malformations can be classified as truncular or extratruncular. Truncular vascular malformations are thought to arise at a later embryologic stage when cells have lost some of their proliferative ability. Because of this, these lesions have a lower risk of recurrence but because they affect vascular trunks, they have increased hemodynamic consequences. In contrast, extratruncular vascular malformations arise earlier in embryonic life from mesodermal remnants that retain high proliferative potential. Because of this, these lesions have increased risk of recurrence. As we mentioned before, vascular anomalies encompasses a large range of abnormalities, and the appropriate diagnosis and treatment will require close collaboration with a diverse interdisciplinary group that may include surgeons, dermatologists, geneticists, and other subspecialists. Although later in this talk we will discuss the appropriate imaging diagnosis of vascular anomalies, the importance of clinical and physical exam findings cannot be overemphasized. Often, the diagnosis will be apparent from the physical exam. Key features to ask about when taking a history include age of presentation, skin coloration, compressibility, changes in size, pain, or bleeding, to name a few. There are no laboratory findings that are diagnostic for vascular anomalies. Rather, any laboratory workup is typically to rule out other diagnoses, such as infection or cancer. In some cases, large venous malformations may cause a localized coagulopathy and may have an elevated D-dimer. Additionally, cases may be associated with genetic syndromes, which would be associated with the corresponding genetic findings.
Although frequently the diagnosis is clear from history and physical exam, imaging may be used to confirm a diagnosis or give you a diagnosis if the clinical picture is unclear. For vascular anomalies, the imaging modalities most frequently used are ultrasound and MRI. Most often, ultrasound imaging will be performed first and will usually give or confirm a diagnosis. In some cases, MRI may be required to differentiate between several types of vascular anomalies. For lesions requiring treatment, almost all patients will require both ultrasound and MRI. Especially for treatment planning, MRI is important to reveal the extent of the lesion. Other forms of imaging such as MRA, MRV, and angiography also have indications in certain cases. In general, CT is not indicated for vascular anomalies. There are certain cases where CT is indicated, such as the need to determine if there is any bony involvement of AVMs, but as a general rule, this type of imaging is not indicated. Similarly, radiographs are not generally indicated for the diagnosis or treatment planning of vascular anomalies. In the case of venous malformations, radiographs may reveal calcified phleboliths, but this is not adequate for the diagnosis and patients would still require ultrasound or MRI. Treatment of vascular anomalies is highly dependent not only on the type of vascular anomaly, but also the location and the extent of the lesion. Some lesions may require no treatment at all, while others may require surgical resection. Importantly, treatment should be reserved for symptomatic lesions only. Treatment is generally invasive and therefore has the potential for complications and poor outcomes. The most common benign vascular tumors in children are hemangiomas. These are true benign neoplasms composed of vessels. Hemangiomas can be further classified as infantile or congenital. Infantile hemangiomas are the most common vascular anomaly overall. As the name suggests, infantile hemangiomas typically present in infancy. The classic clinical story is a baby who is born without any skin lesions, but then has a red-pink skin lesion appear around two weeks to two months of age. Infantile hemangiomas also have a characteristic pattern of growth, where these lesions grow rapidly for several months, stabilize, and then spontaneously resolve. Infantile hemangiomas can also be distinguished from congenital hemangiomas by positive GLUT1 staining on histology. Congenital hemangiomas, as the name suggests, are present at birth. These hemangiomas can be classified based on their resolution. Rapidly involuting hemangiomas will completely resolve by 6 to 14 months of age, whereas non-involuting will show no change. These lesions have a very distinctive clinical appearance, classically referred to as the strawberry hemangioma due to their strawberry red-pink coloring. In some cases, infantile hemangiomas may be preceded by a flat pink lesion, and in some cases hemangiomas may ulcerate and bleed. Ultrasound is the first line imaging for hemangiomas if the diagnosis is unclear. The findings on ultrasound would show a well-circumscribed lesion with high vascular density, although the vessels may not be apparent without color Doppler. Usually no treatment is required for these lesions as most will involute spontaneously. In some severe cases that do not spontaneously resolve and are disfiguring, surgical resection may be required. Because there are rare malignant vascular tumors that may occur in children, it is important to keep these other diagnoses in mind if the child is older or if the clinical story does not fit the typical clinical picture for a hemangioma. Capillary malformations are a type of vascular malformation and represent what we commonly call birthmarks. These lesions affect capillaries in the papillary dermis and can range in color from light pink, such as the classic stork kiss lesion, to the purple-red port wine stain. These lesions are common on the face and are also often segmental and unilateral. Clinically, capillary malformations are not significant, but workup and treatment is warranted due to the association with syndromes such as Serge Weber or for cosmetic reasons. In particular, lesions in the V1 segment or midline facial capillary malformations are associated with Sturge Weber and warrant further workup. Typically, imaging is not necessary to make a diagnosis of capillary malformation, but if the diagnosis is unclear, ultrasound may be performed, especially to rule out other diagnoses. On ultrasound, a capillary malformation will appear as subtle abnormalities in the subcutaneous fat. MRI is not indicated for the diagnosis of capillary malformation, but may be performed as CNS involvement is suspected, such as in Sturge-Weber. 
Capillary malformations typically do not require treatment, although laser ablation may be performed to improve the coloration of the lesion if it is disfiguring. For refractory lesions, surgical resection may be performed. Lymphatic malformations are a vascular malformation composed of abnormal lymphatic channels. These lesions are congenital, but may not become clinically apparent until later in life. Lymphatic malformations can be further divided based on the size of the lymphatic chambers. Microcystic lymphatic malformations are composed of lymphatic chambers less than 2 cm, whereas macrocystic lymphatic malformations are composed of lymphatic chambers greater than 2 cm. Clinically, these lesions typically appear as a soft, compressible mass with usually normal overlying skin, although there can be variability in the appearance. If there has been interlesional bleeding, the mass may have red discoloration. Microcystic lesions may also have cutaneous vesicles that are filled with a clear fluid and can weep. Unlike some other lesions, these lesions will never regress, although they can enlarge due to bleeding or infection. In fact, parents may initially present when the child acquires an acute illness, such as a URI, and then presents with an enlarging or newly symptomatic mass that was not previously appreciated. Clinically, these lesions can appear very similar to venous malformations, which we will discuss next. So imaging is often required to either confirm the diagnosis or differentiate between several suspected diagnoses. Because these are lymphatic channels, ultrasound and Doppler will not demonstrate flow within the channels. To confirm the diagnosis of a lymphatic malformation, MRI will demonstrate enhancement on T2 imaging, but without post-contrast enhancement. MRI is also critical for treatment planning to demonstrate the extent of the lesion. Lymphatic malformations can be managed in a variety of ways, depending on the extent and symptoms of the lesion, as well as the size of the lymphatic channels. Microcystic malformations may be composed of small chambers that will be difficult to access, and in addition may be so numerous and widespread that treating or removing all is impossible. Small asymptomatic lesions can be managed expectantly. The first-line treatment for symptomatic lesions is sclerotherapy. Surgical resection is also performed for lymphatic malformations, or a combination of sclerotherapy and surgical resection depending on the size and extent of the patient's malformation. Venous malformations are composed of abnormal venous channels and are the most common type of vascular malformation. Venous malformations may appear anywhere on the body and appear as a soft, compressible lesion that may have blue or purple discoloration. Some distinguishing characteristics that are unique to venous malformations include changes in size based on patient positioning or activities such as crying, and unlike lymphatic malformations, these lesions should not enlarge with infection. As I said before, venous malformations and lymphatic malformations can appear very similar clinically, and imaging will usually be needed to confirm the diagnosis. Ultrasound with color Doppler is the first-line imaging modality, and classically will demonstrate low flow chambers that may have hyperechoic phlebolus. However, it is important to note that the flow in these malformations may be so slow that it is not picked up on color Doppler, especially if the operator does not adjust the settings to detect low flow. And because of this, the imaging of venous malformations may appear identical to lymphatic malformations on ultrasound. Therefore, MRI can be performed to further differentiate between these two. Venous malformations will also show T2 enhancement, but unlike lymphatic malformations, will demonstrate post-contrast enhancement. For treatment planning, angiography is an additional modality that can help demonstrate the extent of the lesion and will also help reveal any arterial involvement if there is any suspicion of a component of arterial venous malformation. As I mentioned before, in cases of large venous malformations, there may be a localized intravascular coagulopathy. The first sign treatment for venous malformations is sclerotherapy or embolization. Surgery is not first line, but may be performed in certain cases. Arterial venous malformations are composed of both abnormal arterial and venous vessels, usually with the nidus with arterial supply. Clinically, these appear as a palpable soft tissue mass or bony mass, which is often pulsatile with a thrill. These are commonly intracranial. These lesions progress through typical stages, which eventually lead to ulceration, bleeding, and ultimately high output heart failure. The key finding on ultrasound will be demonstration of high pulsatile flow consistent with arterial flow. MRI should be performed to reveal the extent and involvement of the lesion. 
and geography is also useful for treatment planning and to identify feeding vessels. Unique to AVMs, CT may also be useful if there is bony involvement. These malformations are difficult to cure, and the focus of treatment should be on symptom management. It is important to note that the goal should be removal of the arteriovenous nidus, as removing only the feeding or draining vessels can lead to rapid recruitment of collaterals. Embolization and sclerotherapy are first-line treatments, with surgery as a second-line option. As you can see on the right, these malformations can have different architecture, which can be classified as three main types. This is important to understand because this can determine treatment approach. As you can see from the diagrams on the right, these types vary in how many draining veins or venules there are, and the size of feeding arteries and arterioles. Because of this, types 1 and 2 can be treated from transarterial or transvenous routes. Type 3 AVMs can only be treated by the transarterial route. Transvenous treatment is contraindicated for type 3 AVMs because transvenous treatment will block the draining venules but will fail to eradicate the nidus. All of these AVMs can be treated by direct puncture of the nidus, except for type 3A, which are typically too fine for a direct puncture. Now that we have covered each type of vascular anomaly, I want to review the imaging characteristics for each type and how to differentiate between all the different vascular anomalies based on imaging findings. After this, we will go through examples for each type. You may have noticed on the previous slides there are really four key types of images we need to look at. First line imaging will be ultrasound and color Doppler. And to confirm our diagnoses, we will then look at T2-weighted MRI and post-contrast MRI images. Ultrasound will primarily differentiate between vascular tumors and vascular malformations. Vascular tumors will be a well-circumscribed mass, whereas vascular malformations will appear to be vascular channels. When we turn on color Doppler, we may be able to further differentiate between these. Vascular tumors will show flow within the anomaly on color Doppler, and in addition, you may see a well-defined vascular stock supplying the tumor. Color Doppler of vascular malformations will show different types of flow depending on the type of malformation. Lymphatic malformations will have no flow, venous malformations will have low flow, and arteriovenous malformations will have a component of arterial flow. However, keep in mind, the flow in venous malformations may be so slow that it may be missed. MRI is not typically needed to confirm a diagnosis of vascular tumor such as hemangioma, although these lesions will show both T2 and post-contrast enhancement. For vascular malformations, to confirm our diagnosis and further differentiate between the malformations, we can look at T2 MRI and MRI post-contrast. Remember that T2 is fluid enhancing, therefore we expect all three types to be T2 enhancing. Because lymphatic malformations are not connected with arterial or venous supply, they will not enhance on post-contrast MRI, and this will differentiate them from our other vascular malformations. Arteriovenous malformations will also be identifiable on MRI by their unique flow voids, which appear as small hypointense regions within the lesion due to high turbulent flow. Now that we've gone over the imaging characteristics for vascular anomalies, I want to go through some examples to demonstrate what we just discussed. In this first example, we have both a transverse and a longitudinal view of a vascular anomaly. And in both these views, we see a discrete lesion, outlined here, which as we discussed on the last slide, is most consistent with a hemangioma. When we turn on color Doppler, we see the vascularity of this mass, as well as an identifiable vascular stock feeding the mass. This is consistent with a hemangioma. Further classification of the hemangioma as congenital or infantile would be possible with clinical history or histology. In contrast to the previous example, in this ultrasound image, we do not see a discrete mass. Instead, we see large hypoechoic spaces consistent with vascular channels. And in this image, although we have color Doppler on, we do not see any flow within the channels. This is most consistent with a lymphatic malformation, but it could also be a venous malformation with very slow flow. To confirm our diagnosis, we look at MRI. On our T2 images on the left, we see a large lesion on the left side that is enhancing, which is consistent with a vascular malformation. And when we look at the post-contrast image on the right, we see there's no post-contrast enhancement. This is consistent with a lymphatic malformation. Here's another example where we do not see a discrete mass. 
Again, we see hypoechoic spaces, although they are much smaller in this image. Again, we have color Doppler on, but do not see any flow within the hypoechoic channels. Like our previous example, this is consistent with a lymphatic malformation, but could also be a venous malformation with very slow flow. To differentiate between venous and lymphatic malformations, we will again look at MRI. As expected, we see an enhancing lesion on T2-weighted MRI, consistent with a vascular malformation. However, in this example, when we look at the post-contrast MRI on the right, we see that the lesion enhances post-contrast. Because our contrast causes the lesion to enhance, we know this is a venous malformation. For our last example, you can see this vascular anomaly is again composed of hypoechoic channels. When we apply color Doppler, we see very high flow within the anomaly. This high flow is consistent with an arteriovenous malformation. The MRI imaging demonstrates a T2 enhancing malformation, and in the image on the right, we can see flow voids, which confirm that this is an arteriovenous malformation. Angiography can also confirm that a malformation is arteriovenous and is also useful for treatment planning. The image on the left is the same arteriovenous malformation prior to any treatment. From this image, we can confirm that this malformation has both arterial and venous components, as we can see both the arteries and the veins of the forearm in this image. In the post-treatment image on the right, you can see that we now do not have any early venous filling, as well as preserved arterial flow to the hand. This concludes our talk. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you enjoyed learning about vascular anomalies.